Uh, hello, everyone. I would like uh, to welcome you all uh, to the Ibromina Neurogenetics Online School uh, that's held in Tunis uh, from December 10 to 12. Uh, my name is uh, Firas Kubaisi. I'm uh, an associate professor at the American University of Beirut, uh, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. So today we are talking about uh, one uh, prevalent uh, disorder, which is uh, traumatic brain injury, better known as TBI. I'll be talking about biomarkers, which is um, one important area in traumatic brain injury. And I'll be talking about the tools for neuroproteomics. For you who are interested in uh, my research and they have uh, questions, my email is uh, at the bottom, which is firasco at gmail.com. So the outline of uh, my uh, talk is will involve introduction about uh, traumatic brain injury, definition, and prevalence in the MENA region, which is an area that we are uh, working in. And then we'll talk about biomarkers and uh, how we uh, study biomarkers using animal models of uh, TBI, which is traumatic brain injury. And we will give like a short introduction about uh, proteomics and our analysis with the future uh, direction. That's how we are concluding. So. Let me start with a famous saying uh, with uh, Hippocrates uh, in 2,500 years ago. He said, no head injury is too severe to despair of, nor it is too trivial to ignore. That means that even mild brain injury, looking at it, we thought that it is not important, but it turned out after 2,500 years that even if we have a repetitive mild injury, such as what we see in sport injury, it is very important to take care of because it is leading to neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, and something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So traumatic brain injury, according to the Center for Disease and the Prevention, it is defined as disruption of the normal function due to the hit in the brain. It can be penetrating head injury or it can be like just a hit as we see in uh, sport injury. And it is quite prevalent in the whole world, and it is why a worldwide uh, occurring. Uh, brain injury, it is not a single event that's actually distingu uh, distinguishing it from other diseases and other disorders. It is a complex process. It is involving a lot of molecular and pathological events happening at different time points. So we have to characterize TBI as spatiotemporal changes, and there are no two TBIs that are alike. It is extremely heterogeneous kind of disease. So if you look at what's happening across time, we see like at the beginning, we have injury occurring. That's time equals zero. And as we are progressing, we have different kind of cell injury occurring. So at the beginning, we have necrosis. We have axonal injury. After a few days, we have apoptosis. And later on, we have cellular response such as microgliosis and neurogeneration occurring weeks and months after injury. And this is here on my right screen. We see like a snapshot of the molecular changes that are occurring involving calpain, caspase, uh, mitochondrial uh, changes, excitotoxicity due to uh, uh, glutaminergic activation. And we have cell death and we have mitochondrial uh, uh, oxidative stress occurring. So having said this, uh, TBI occurs in two phases, the primary phase and the secondary phase. In the primary phase, we have actually mechanical damage, vascular disruption, axonal shearing. In the secondary phase, we have oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, apoptosis, and this is occurring weeks and months after injury. This is taken from a study that we have like published, showing like across time what we are seeing but between like the early T0 and occurring at minutes, hours, and days and weeks after injury. <clears throat> so why we are very uh, interested in TBI? It has been actually considered as a silent epidemic. In the United States alone, we have 1.7 annual TBI cases. 80% of all TBIs are mild injury occurring in sport injury or someone who is falling on the head without having like a penetrating object entering. It is costing 85 billion in the United States. This is very, very important number to take care of. And it is higher than even HIV and other kinds of diseases in terms of cost. TBI, it is a major theme in military conflicts and in contact sports. And it shows like mild TBI when we are hitting our heads repeatedly, such, and, uh, such as in boxing or American football in hockey, and even in military conflicts, these are always affecting our 
neuropsychiatric outcomes and affecting us on the molecular levels, leading to accumulation of certain proteins such as tau protein or TDP proteins in the brains after being like exposed to repeated injuries. And they are not actually trivial. This is very important to look at mild injuries. For you who are MDs and who are clinicians, uh, classification of TBI can be uh, according to the neurological scores such as Glasgow coma scales, loss of un unconsciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, and they categorize uh, TBI according to mild, moderate, severe injury, and these have different scores. So to us as like uh, researchers, we are very interested in the mild TBI because it represents 80% of all cases. And uh, frequently, it is usually like we don't care about uh, TBI as being mild. We usually discharge the patients. We don't care what they are uh, happening afterwards. Well, it turned out that repeated, and what we say, it's very important to look at this word, repeated mild TBI or repeated hits to the brain, such as in soccer, like football, or in uh, uh, American football, we are recognizing or inboxing that we have a lot of patients developing neuropsychiatric disorders and develop what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, so TBI has different flavors. It can come with open head injury. It is when we have a penetrating object entering here. And usually it is characterized by being focal. It is one area of the brain compared to closed head injury, which we will call as mild TBI. It is diffused. It is affecting high area of the brain and it is if it is occurring at repeated kind of uh, um, mild injury this is actually leading to cell death at a different pace when we have open head injury so these are like uh, certain characteristics that are distinguishing open head injury from closed head injury now let us move into the arab world and uh, look at certain numbers that actually are really like uh, surprising so in the Arab world, we have high levels of TBI. In Oman, it is considered the highest road accident in the world, where we have actually 30.4 rates per 100,000, where the global average is 18.3. In Qatar, it is considered the 11th highest motorization injury rate. In Lebanon, we have high prevalence of 1,590 TBIs per uh, 100,000, where we, the global average is 75 numbers, uh, 759 compared to the global average. And these numbers are seriously, seriously uh, surprising, and they need like a follow-up, which we are not doing. So this is actually initiated uh, a study to look at the epidemiological and clinical characteristics of TBI in Lebanon. And this was uh, held in 2016 with uh, my lab. And we found out there are a lot of gap of knowledge in and these are the major things. Mild TBI patients had no clear documentation of safe discharge. So usually they tell them like, oh, it is uh, a mild, you can leave. There is no like follow up on these patients. Severe cases of TBI usually are rarely reaching hospitals. They are often dying. So if you have like a severe TBI case on a motorcycle, they are not like um, well uh, documented and or they are not well even uh, reaching the hospital. And we found a lot of uh, uh, weaknesses in the system in terms of how to manage or diagnose TBI. Currently, in the whole world, we don't have a clear-cut measure for rapid diagnosing TBI. This is important for finding a biomarker similar to other diseases, such as cardiac diseases. When we look at the troponin or liver diseases, looking at uh, uh, SGOT, SGPT, there is no FDA-approved drug for TBI treatment. Thus, we need a biomarker to look at therapy when we are looking at TBI. So this actually led us to write the Nature uh, Middle East article. We are looking at the MENA region TBI, looking at research where we don't have any in the whole MENA region. So we were asking, like, we have absence of legislative uh, measures that protect the civilians from uh, daily like accidents. We have a continual war themes in Lebanon and other areas uh, in the MENA regions. We have continual kind of uh, lack of management and diagnosing for TBI research. So this was something that we raised awareness for in our MENA region. As I said, there is no clear cut measures for rapid diagnosing of TBI. This is uh, necessitating the need for diagnostic markers and the need of therapeutic and th diagnostic biomarkers to tell us we have therapy and good diagnosis. This will lead us to answering 
why do we need a biomarker and what is a biomarker? So remember, annually we have, this is actually in around the world, we have 50 million cases of TBI around the world. We have a cost of 400 billion per year and there are no approved drugs. So in order to diagnose TBI and especially MTBI, we would like to have a secret like or um, excellent biomarker, which we don't have. There is no FDA approved to get like a good drug to treat these kind of cases. And that's actually initiating the need for starting a biomarker. So what's a biomarker? It is a biological entity that objectively measure and evaluate indicator of normal biological process to the baseline. If we have pathological or pathogenic process, or we have a pharmacological response to a therapy. And we have different flavors of biomarkers. These can be proteins such as uh, UCHL1, uh, neurofilaments, um, tau protein, microRNA based. It can be physiological biomarkers such as levels of uh, oxygen. It can be imaging biomarkers such as CT, MRI. However, let me talk about CT and MRI. These are expensive, not available in all institutions. And these are what we use for TBI uh, diagnosis uh, in clinical cases. However, these are not widely available and they are quite expensive to conduct on all patients. So what we aim is identify a troponin of the brain and the troponin is a biomarker for uh, cardiac uh, conditions. And we hope that uh, we can find uh, a blood biomarker in the brain that can indicate severity or localization of TBI. And if we find this, we can easily say that we are profoundly changed medical practice in the, uh, the area of traumatic brain injury. So different studies among uh, which uh, like our labs have identified a number of proteins and these were uh, identified using uh, proteomics that we'll talk about. However, many of these were conducted in animal models of traumatic brain injury because we cannot get a brain easily from a person just by hitting his brain and taking like a sample. The, remember, the brain is most uh, valuable organ. It is not as easy to access compared to other organs, compared uh, to other uh, diseases. This is uh, one of uh, the figures that we have uh, published talking about how the disease in TBI is progressing across time. And there are different kinds of biomarkers that tells us we have acute injury, we have subacute injury, we have chronic injury, we have a severe injury, mild or moderate. So this is very important to develop a biomarker for these kind of segregation of the TBI. And the best way to identify this is to have a good uh, animal model that I'll describe or introduce in one second. However, our hypothesis is when we have a brain injury, there is a neural uh, uh, injury occurring leading to brain cell injury, and this will go to the extracellular fluid. Then from the extracellular fluid, it will go to the CSF. From the CSF, it will go to the blood. And then from the blood, we are identifying the valuable biomarkers. And for you who are uh, in the neuroscience, they know what kind of dilution. The brain tissue is so small, it is going to a huge like uh, uh, area, which is extracellular fluid. And from there, we are taking a drop in the CSF and then a drop from the CSF, it's going to the blood. So you are seeing the huge dilution factor where it is actually staying in the blood for a certain time and then it is cleared. So identifying a biomarker is quite challenging for us. So this is a glimpse of the neural injury and neural injury involves Neuronal cells involves microglial cells, involves capillary and blood vessels, endothelial cells, um, microglia and astrocytes. So you see the story is not as simple as we are envisioning. It is quite complex with the complex kind of cellular components in the brain. So why do we need an animal model? Because this is actually recapitulating what we see in humans. Okay, so if you are interested in this uh, reading about the animal models, the uh, uh, websites that uh, I'm taking this uh, um, literature about uh, animal models are all uh, in this slide. Uh, animal models will depict one kind of uh, characteristic of what we see in humans. However, remember always animal models are not the same as clinical uh, uh, cases that we see. TBI is quite complex. However, we try to find a good animal models that are found in uh, rats, in mice, in actually uh, pigs. 
that we will model how we see like different kind of mild open head, closed head, severe, and that's what you are going to see. So there are approximately six different kind of animal models. One of them is called control cortical impact CCI, and this is actually for the open head. Uh, fluid percussion or weighted drop models. These are for the um, uh, closed head injury uh, when we drop something on the brain. We have blast when we have an explosion. We have chimera that includes uh, includes like rotation and acceleration models. You'll see this in uh, a few slides. So this is what we call CCI. It is a probe that goes into the brain. And this is what happens after entering the brain. This is the probe here. It is hit, hitting the brain of the mouse. And that's what you see after three days. This is actually uh, images from my lab. And that's actually a cartoon showing how the probe enters the brain and inducing this kind of uh, injury to the cellular component of the brain. And uh, here, actually, when you are mounting the mouse, and that's when you are hitting it with a rubber. This is a closed head injury. And here, let me show you like uh, a model of uh, closed head injury. This is the rubber hitting the brain. So this is actually, we are mimicking what happens when someone is actually hit uh, and his brain is closed. So we don't have a probe going inside. This is when we have a probe going inside the brain. So this goes into the brain and goes for a certain time and it go at a certain speed and stays at a certain depth, okay? This is when we are looking at uh, acceleration and rotation injury. So here the head is actually rotating and then the brain actually, it is going back and forth, back and forth. So this is exactly what we are seeing when someone is hitting his head in a sport injury. This here, when we are seeing an explosion, and what you are seeing in this cage are two rats, and here we have detonation of a blast. So see the blast wave, it is affecting us when some explosion is happening, and these are called blast waves, and this is actually leading our brain to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So imagine in military when we have repeated kind of blast injury and blast detonation, what happens to the soldiers after a certain while, then they can develop PTSD and neuropsychiatric disorders because of what you are seeing here. So biomarkers and proteomics are always actually go hand by hand. And that's what I apply on the animal models that I show you, I show you, uh, I showed you before. So what is proteomics? Simply, it is the global analysis of the entire protein complement, which is a proteome in a cell tissue and an organ at a particular time point at a particular area of the brain. So that's what we call as spatiotemporal changes. This is actually applied on cancer, uh, uh, neuroscience, pathological diseases, and now it is actually um, the golden standard to look for protein biomarkers. So let me introduce now some case studies, and we are looking at uh, molecular basis of mild TBI that I showed you before. I took mice that I'm looking at when you hit them only one time or when you are hitting them three times. So this is the study design, my hypothesis, and my aims. So we hypothesize that experimental mouse model of repeated closed head injury, this is mimicking what we see in sport, would actually present with deficit in the neurobehavioral changes, like on the, how the mouse is behaving, leading to cognitive outcomes, memory, and even muscle deficits. And this is actually accompanied with biochemical changes that would be like identified at the protein level expression. So we have a single hit, we have repetitive hits, and we are looking at the changes occurring in the brain. So this is like one mouse, and we have being one mouse hit only one time, and this is actually a mouse being hit three times, and these are compared to the sham animals. And we look at two days, seven days, and 30 days. And see, the study design is quite complex. We have the single hit, single hit, three hits, three hits, and we are looking at the protein changes and the pathways occurring at these different time points. After one hit, after two days, after seven days, after 30 days. And then we are actually analyzing the data. And the data, actually, you are talking about thousands and hundreds of proteins that are changing at each uh, scenario that I'm describing here. 
then what we did, we brought the mice and we tested their ability to stand on a pole. We looked at their grip test. We looked at how they are moving on the ladder. And then we are checking on how they do on elevated plus maze, how they are able to swim, and how they are actually measuring their memory and neurological testing. So after that, we take all their proteins and we compare them across time, across brain region, and across brain, uh, injury modality, which is one hit versus three hits. Okay, so this is actually part of our uh, data that we are seeing how they are protein are being clustered and how they are changing according to time. So this is a heat map of all the proteins that you are seeing. So this is actually one time point showing that we have 3,524 proteins and they are actually changing across time. This is very, very important to look at. Then here we are looking at how the proteins are changing between one hit versus three hits. And here it is actually the pathway analysis of these proteins occurring at one hit versus three hits. And what we are seeing, and this is actually takes a lot of uh, effort in order to get this result. So we look at neuronal death, nerve injury, neurogenitive disorders, oxidative stress, cytokine release, complement activation, and many others according to time. And these data are actually uh, generated from the proteins. All of them are actually from uh, the lab and uh, from the students and looking at how the proteins are being activated leading to different kinds of pathways and molecular mechanisms at one hit versus three hits. This is according to what we see at chronic time points. We are seeing more neurogenesis, synaptogenesis. So the brain it tries to remedy itself and find a cure for itself. Here we did like immunofluorescence and we looked at how the proteins are actually reflected on the cellular level. And we are looking at what we call uh, inflammation, where we see GFAP protein being upregulated. And we are looking at uh, different kinds of uh, cellular markers, which are astrocytic, which is GFAP, or microglial, which is IBA1. And you are seeing like how the different kind between males, sham, and mild TBI after three hits. So we see a lot of IBA, which is microglia markers and GFAP being upregulated at different time points according to with a comparison between the sham and mild TBI after three hits versus the sham that are not being hit. Here we are looking at uh, three hits versus only no hit and we see like mark increase in IBA so we have microgliosis and we have astrocyte uh, uh, elevation in three hits compared to the sham animals. So this is actually the animal model that we are looking at uh, their uh, grip strength. This will measure its muscle changing and the motor function of this uh, mouse. So we are uh, measuring how the ability of this mouse to bind to this grip test. And we do three trials per animal and we look at its change across time. This is what we look at, the pole climbing, and it will measure the balance of the mouse and how it is staying after the, uh, going up the 60 centimeter long pole and how long it will take in order for this mouse to turn on this pole. So with this, I will move into like uh, concluding slides talking about imaging mass spec that we are moving into as novel and uh, unique uh, opportunity for looking at the pathways on the grid of the immunofluorescence of uh, the brain of the uh, mouse that we are looking at. So here it is actually a novel technique in the proteomics. It is called mass spec imaging. And here we are taking slices of the brain and putting uh, or shining laser on them and looking at the proteins changes according to the localization of the brain. So we are comparing hippocampus to the cortex, to the cerebellum at one time from these animals. And this is actually the data that we get. So if I show you the data here, you think I'm doing MRI, but however, this is actually novel uh, uh, technique in uh, what we call brain injury uh, imaging using uh, mass spec. So we are using actually uh, uh, mass spectrometry, but however, it is used for imaging techniques. And here, what we call is performing microproteomic analysis, where we do 2D and 3D uh, imaging mass spec imaging. So you see how the change of the brain is occurring across time. So we are taking sham animal, uh, one hour injury, 
three hour injury and 24 hour injury and we are comparing how the brain is changing in the proteins and this is the change in color can reflect how the protein are changing across time so these are the data that we are uh, gathering from uh, this work and these are already like published you are if you're interested and you have question on them just uh, email me i'll uh, definitely we can discuss uh, uh, the specifics of these and with this i can uh, conclude my presentation talking about some of the resources uh, in the field of uh, traumatic brain injury if uh, you are uh, interested in any of these uh, kind of studies uh, just feel free to email me we have a couple of books that are published on this area all of them talking about uh, uh, systems biology, which we didn't discuss uh, today, uh, talking about bioinformatics and the data analysis of these kind of uh, proteomics uh, generated data, or the molecular and pathological changes that are occurring, or the animal models that are involved in uh, traumatic brain injury. Okay, uh, for you who are uh, able to attend, uh, who attended actually uh, our uh, MENA EBRO. Um, uh, in Lebanon last year, these are uh, part of our uh, uh, pictures, and there are a lot of participants who are actually participating in Tunis who came to Lebanon last year. And uh, these are uh, the PIs, and here uh, Dr. Samia and Dr. Mohamed Salama that, and Dr. Wael Mohamed Faraj. All of them are going to present to you uh, in Tunis this year, and uh, I wish you uh, best luck. Hopefully, we are uh, recovering from. Uh, the COVID and we are able to meet uh, in face again. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you Dr. Samia for inviting me for this uh, uh, conference for Ibro MENA 2020. Thank you so much.